This is a lecture about how neurons work, how they send signals to other neurons, and how those other neurons interpret that information. So this is a typical neuron. They all look a little different. But you have the cell body right here, sometimes called the soma. There's the nucleus. It's like any other cell in your body. It's got mitochondria. It's got the Golgi. It's got all these other structures. But it also has structures kind of unique to neurons. One, these dendrites here get information from other neurons. Other neurons send their signals to these dendrites, and the dendrites bring that signal into the cell body. The axon here, right here, sends information away from the cell body towards other neurons. Now it can be surrounded by myelin here. Myelin's kind of a fatty tissue. It helps to insulate the axon, but also speeds up the conduction, how fast that signal is sent down. It's an electrical signal that, sends, that is sent down to this terminal end. It also has these little spaces where there's really not a lot of myelin, and those are called the nodes of Ranvier. And finally, we get down here at the end, and that signal causes the release of chemicals known as neurotransmitters. That's what this whole lecture is about, about that process. So let's do a little chemistry here so we understand the basics of how charged particles work. Here's an element here, sodium, and here's chlorine and it has protons and neutrons and electrons that spin around in these outer shells. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and neutrons don't have a charge. If there's the same amount of protons as electrons, then this doesn't have a charge to it. But it's kind of weird about these things is that they don't like having an uneven number of electrons in these outer shells here that are these dotted lines. It wants to have eight. Here sodium only has one, so it can lose that easily. But chlorine has seven in its outermost shell and it wants eight. So what happens when sodium and chlorine are put into a solution, they dissolve and the electron is lost by sodium and gained by chlorine. And now chlorine has an extra negative charge, and sodium has an extra positive charge. So we call these ions, and we say this is a sodium ion because it has a charge to it. And this is a chloride ion because it has a negative charge. But let's look at the membrane that surrounds the neuron. The membrane, is, think of the membrane as kind of like, if you had a water balloon, it's the balloon. It's the part that keeps the stuff in. Now the inside of the cell, the inside has a negative charge compared with the outside. The membrane has a polarity. We call it a polarity. It's like a pole. It's like the, the poles of the earth. We have a positive and negative side. We have poles of a magnet. We have a positive and negative sign, side. But a membrane also has, has poles. It has a negative on the inside compared with the outside. That's a polarity. This is maintained by taking these sodium ions that are positively charged and actively pumping them out. If there's sodium on the inside, you pump it out. Now there's more negative on the inside and a lot more positive on the outside. So let's look at this. This is my drawing of a membrane. The membrane here is what's known as a phospholipid bilayer. That's this here. And it can allow certain things in and, and be a barrier to others. Inside the membrane, you have these proteins, these large protein channels. Well, if this channel is closed, then the positive sodium here wants to come in because positive is attracted to negative and there's a lot of negative on the inside. The negative on the inside of a neuron is primarily caused by proteins. That is um, here as an A, A minus. Here, look at all this sodium on the outside. The sodium wants to come in for a number of reasons. One, it's drawn in, it's pulled in to the negative, like a positive and negative side of a magnet. There's also a lot of sodium on the outside. And we have what's called a diffusion pressure. That means 
sodium goes where it's not. It, it, if there's a high concentration on the outside, it goes to where there's a low concentration. That's a diffusion pressure. It's also pushed off. Sodium, um, like two positive sides of a magnet, are pushing away from each other. So we have a diffusion pressure and we also have the electrostatic pressure of positive being attracted in. This is another way of looking at it. Sodium has these pressures to come in, electrostatic pressure, forces of diffusion. And the other common elements are chlorine, chloride, and potassium. And there's a little bit more chlorine, chloride on the outside than the inside. But the inside of the cell is negative compared to the outside, if we were to compare the two. That's a very important thing. So at rest, when a neuron's not doing anything, it's about a negative 70 millivolts on the inside compared with the outside. That's because the positive sodium ions are so much more on the outside. That's at rest. But we can also have a case where sodium is allowed to come in. We call that a depolarization, to remove the polarity, to depolarize. So if sodium was to come in, we would start losing that polarity. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about now has to do with that depolarization. And then we have what's called a hyperpolarization. That's if we had a lot more positive on the outside than at rest. It might be a negative 75 millivolts on the inside compared to the outside. And we're going to see when a neuron becomes hyperpolarized. So at rest, it's polar, negative on the inside compared to the outside. But we can also change that. We can have positive come in and we remove that polarity, a depolarization. But we can also hyperpolarize, really polarize, a lot more positive on the outside compared to the in. So here's that membrane again, and we have all these channels. Think of these as gates that open up and close and open and close. And these channels can be very specific to certain ions. We could have a sodium channel. We can have a potassium channel. Sometimes they're called gates. So how do these ion channels open up? Well, one way they open up is almost like an electrical switch. It's a big protein, and it opens up when the polarity around it, when the charge around it, meets a very specific le level. We call that a threshold. These are known as voltage-dependent ion channels, or voltage-gated ion channels. They open when the fluid around them has a certain amount of charge to it. But they can also be opened by chemicals almost like a, uh, a key fitting into a lock. A chemical comes to that channel and unlocks it and opens it up. So let's look at these two things. Let's say, for example, a chemical comes along and comes here, and this is a chemical gated ion channel. So it comes in and it fits in like this. These are often called neurotransmitters, though there are other things that can do this. So let's say a neurotransmitter comes in and opens up this ion channel. Well, sodium comes rushing in because it wants to come in. There's all those pressures for it to come in. But if you look at this over here, this is a voltage-gated ion channel next to it. And this voltage-gated ion channel is no longer negative 70 on the inside compared to the outside. There's all these positive charges. Now we've changed the polarity. In fact, we've depolarized it to meet a threshold. Now this opens up because of the voltage around it, and it can let sodium in as well. Now this voltage-gated ion channel can be all along an axon, one after the other. And if this one gets depolarized and meets its threshold, sodium can come in, but that can affect this one down here. And that can open up, and sodium can come in, and that can affect this one down here. And we have what's known as a propagation of a signal going down from one end to the other. Let's watch that. Okay? So it's negative 70 on the inside compared to the outside. This channel opens up, and a bunch of sodium comes in. It affects the next 
voltage gated ion channel. It meets its threshold, not negative 70, negative 65, because there's more positive now on the inside because of that sodium. And it opens up, sodium comes rushing in, and it affects the voltage gated ion channel a little further down. And it opens up, and sodium comes in, and it goes all, this whole signal goes all the way down. And it's a way of sending a signal. We'll come back to that. Meanwhile, these channels begin to close, and they get to a point where they can't open. Even if sodium comes in, they're in a point where they can't open, known as refractory. So let's back up a little bit, and here is the soma over here, and this is the axon. Where the cell body, soma, meets the axon, that's known as the axon hillock. But look at these voltage-gated ion channels here. And then what's here is I have depicted as myelin, okay, this fatty tissue. And so what's going to happen is, is we're going to get a depolarization here. It's going to affect this one, then affect this one, and then affect this one. We're going to get a bouncing down the axon at these empty spaces, these nodes of Ranvier. So action potential goes down. That's what it's called when a, when a signal travels down an axon. It's known as an action potential. It's a series of voltage-gated ion channels and a depolarization that goes all the way down. One affects the next one. Well, let's look at this because this is sort of a chart of what is happening. Let's look. We are here at rest. Over here is the membrane potential the negativity on the inside compared to the outside. Down here is time. So let's say some ion channels open up and some sodium comes in. We're going to begin to depolarize the cell membrane right at that spot. But here is a threshold, a level that the voltage-gated ion channels will open. They won't open until they reach that level. But once they reach that polarity level, negative 65, a lot of them open and a whole bunch of sodium comes rushing in, a mass depolarization. So that's where we were just at right now. We saw that voltage-gated ion channels for sodium opened up and sodium was allowed to enter into the cell. But what happens next? Let's come back to this slide. So here we are again at the membrane. But there is another voltage-gated ion channel right next to the sodium, and that one is potassium. Potassium is a positively charged ion as well. So when a sodium ion channel opens up because it's, it's, because it's met its threshold at negative 65, this channel opens up later, and potassium leaves. So first sodium comes in, and we have a depolarization. Then potassium channels open up and we have a repolarization. Depolarization by sodium and a repolarization by potassium. Recall that um, polarization means a difference of negativity on the inside compared to the out. So if we started with negative on the inside compared to the out, we, we bring positive in and that depolarizes the membrane. But if we push potassium out, it's getting back to that polarity. It's getting back to being more negative on the inside than the out. So here we are. Sodium has rushed in, and we're depolarizing the cell. But now we meet a different threshold, a potassium channel threshold. That's not negative 65. That's way up here. And potassium begins to leave. But sodium is still coming in. And here, sodium channels now close. Sodium can't come in anymore, but potassium can continue to leave. If potassium leaves, then it's going to repolarize the cell, repolarize until it finally closes here. Let's look at it again. Meets, the sodium channels meet their threshold. That's the dotted line. They open up. Potassium channels then open up and repolarize. Sodium channels open up depolarize the cell, potassium channels open up, 
and begin to repolarize the cell, but sodium is still coming in. Sodium is blocked, those sodium channels close. Positive ions can't come in anymore, but positive ions in the form of potassium can still leave, and it becomes more negative, potassium leaving, more negative, potassium stays open, channels, potassium channels still leave, still leave, and finally they close. But if you notice here, we get to a point where it's way more negative on the inside than the outside, even more so than at rest, a hyperpolarization. And right now, this area can't go through the cycle again because it's hyperpolarized. So let's look at this again. Here is that axon, and here is the axon hillock, and here is the beginning of the, of the cell body. And we're going to get a depolarization followed by a repolarization. This depolarization is going to affect it here, and here, and here, and the repolarization is going to follow. Depolarization, repolarization, and that travels down the axon. The whole purpose of a neuron is to send a signal from one part of your brain to another, from one part of your spinal cord to another. We have to get that signal. And the signal is, in this case, caused by sodium and potassium. It's an electrical signal. So there's our cell body again. And you can see that action potential bounce down to the end. That's the action potential, the depolarization and repolarization. And now we have a signal. Now that signal can speed up, in other words, number of signals per second. What it can't do is it can't change its speed, it can't stop, and it can't slow down. All it is is the number of action potentials per second. That's the signal frequency. That's the signal information. So in other words, the number of signals per second can increase. So, the depolarization is caused by sodium channels opening up, and the repolarization is caused by potassium channels opening up and leaving. Sodium in, potassium out. But now, we have a lot of sodium on the inside and a lot of potassium on the outside, and we don't want that. We want the sodium out, and we want the potassium in so that we can do the signals again. And in order to get that back, we have a pump, a protein in the phospholipid bilayer. It's known as a sodium-potassium pump. But it needs energy because we're really pushing things back against the gradient. Remember, it's still really positive out here. And we're going to try to take these, these sodium ions and push them out against the gradient and against the electrostatic pressure. So we need energy to do that. And this potassium, sodium-potassium pump uses energy in the form of ATP. When ATP is converted to ADP, this pump gets a phosphorus group. We convert ADP with two Ps to ATP with three Ps. We do that in the cell when we break up sugars. Um, in cellular respiration, in the mitochondria, we make all this ATP. So let's watch this three sodiums attached to the sodium potassium pump. Then we add some energy. Sodium is expelled and potassium comes in and potassium is brought back in. Three sodiums out for every two potassiums in. And we had to use energy to do that. This is one of the reasons you need food. You need sugar in your brain because you need to have this pump constantly going and that needs energy. Let's watch it one more time. Sodium attaches, then the phosphorus group helps to run the sodium potassium um, engine. Sodium comes out, potassium comes in, and the sodium, um, the potassium comes in, and the phosphorus group is then taken off. In order to get that phosphorus group back on here, we need to metabolize sugars and things like that. Here's another view of it, just another animation. And how many potassiums come in? Two potassiums come in. Sodium potassium pump. So what happens when that signal gets all the way down to the end?
the action potential bounces all the way down to the end, it ultimately causes the release of neurotransmitters. The more action potentials per second, the more neurotransmitters are released. And it's done so at the terminal end of the axon. Between the axon and the other cell, we have a place called a, a space called a synapse. And we're going to look at that synapse with some detail now. So here's my drawing of a synapse. Here's the other cell. Maybe it is a dendrite over here. This we might call a dendritic spine. And here are some chemical gated ion channels. And this is all kind of exaggerated a bit. Here's the myelin. And there's a new ion we need to talk about. That ion is calcium. Calcium is positively charged. In fact, it has two positive charges. There are voltage-gated calcium channels here at the terminal end, and they open when the action potential comes down. Here are vesicles. Vesicles are holders of neurotransmitters. You package these neurotransmitters in balloons. You can make them in the cell body and transport them down. You can repackage them, but they're held by these balloons. We want those neurotransmitters to be released into the synapse or the synaptic cleft. So the action potential comes down, opens up calcium channels, and calcium helps the vesicles to fuse and ultimately they fuse with that cell membrane, they dissolve and they release their neurotransmitters and the neurotransmitters float over to the postsynaptic cell. Do it one more time. Action potential comes down, opens calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium comes in and helps vesicles to fuse, and we get a release of neurotransmitters. This is called exocytosis outside the cell. Neurotransmitters go across, and they fit like keys in a lock into these receptors. The more action potentials, the more calcium, the more neurotransmitters. We call this the presynaptic cell. We call this the postsynaptic cell. So let's take a look at this. We're going to see here we have myelin. This is the axon. This is the myelin. And the action potential is going to bounce down all the way down and ultimately cause the release of neurotransmitters. Kind of reminds me of that. Black Eyed Peas song. Okay, so the action potential is bouncing down and causing the release of neurotransmitters. Now, my neurotransmitters aren't in vesicles like they should be, but I think you get the point. So let's talk about those neurotransmitters. These are just chemicals. They're, they're actually very small chemicals in, in many ways. Uh, and they are produced by the neuron. Um, and they are sent across the synapse to affect postsynaptic receptors. These are neurotransmitters. They fit like a key into a lock. Action potential comes down. Calcium comes in and neurotransmitters are released. Now remember that they aren't exactly guided to these receptors. They have to find them, you know, by chance really. So the more neurotransmitters release, the better likelihood they will affect this postsynaptic cell. So a neurotransmitter finds that receptor, neurotransmitter, and sodium comes rushing in, can affect now, if enough sodium comes in, let's say, it can then affect voltage-gated ion channels on the, at the axon hillock, on the axon, and we can get then that propagation. So, so first you have a chemical-gated ion channel that then will cause enough depolarization for a voltage-gated ion channel. But that's not the only type of ion channels there are. Sometimes a, a chemical gated ion channel will actually shut things down and keep this from working. So one thing you should know is that 
the action potential comes down and calcium comes in. The more calcium, the no more neurotransmitters are released. But some of those neurotransmitters are floating around and they can get taken up and de denatured by certain enzymes. But a lot of them are just pulled back in through a transport. This is known as reuptake, and it's very important when we end up talking about certain types of drugs. A lot of antidepressants are reuptake inhibitors. They stop this process. So neurotransmitters go across here, some float around and are broken up by enzymes, and there are, some are sucked back in the transport and repackaged. Now this is a very complex system. My drawings don't do near the, the justification for this kind of complexity. Look at all these connections. You know, a neuron can be affected by thousands of other neurons, and that neuron itself can branch out its axons and affect thousands of other neurons. It gets very complex. You know, we have about 85 billion neurons in our brain. And they're connecting with thousands of other neurons. And that's what gives us the complexity of the brain. Not only are they connected to a, thousands of other neurons, each neuron, but they're sending signals at different rates. That's the key. It's the rate of action potential. Now, there's lots of different types of neurotransmitters. And we'll get into them in other classes. But let's just break them down into some groups. Sometimes a neurotransmitter can go across the synaptic cleft and cause that postsynaptic neuron to send more signals. We oftentimes call it firing. We cause that postsynaptic neuron fires more. The action potentials happen more often. So if that presynaptic cell sends across a neurotransmitter that makes the other cell fire more often, we say that neurotransmitter is excitatory because it excites that other neuron and makes it fire more. Glutamate is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It's the most common. We're going to come and talk about it a lot later on. Dopamine is excitatory, although sometimes not. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, sometimes called noradrenaline and adrenaline, these are certainly excitatory neurotransmitters. When they affect another cell, that other cell fires more often. But a neurotransmitter can also keep that other cell from firing more. Maybe it shuts ion channels. Maybe it opens up other channels that hyperpolarize the cell. Whatever it does, it's making that other neuron fire fewer times per second. Decreases the likelihood of sending an action potential. Reduces the number. GABA is the most common inhibitory neurotransmitter. But serotonin is as well. 5-hydroxytryptamine. That's right here. 5-hydroxytryptamine is also serotonin. You've probably heard about serotonin before. So dopamine can be inhibitory, substance P can be inhibitory. These are all neurotransmitters that can be inhibitory. So let's look at a few of them. And a few things that you need to start learning and getting comfortable with is here are the, action, here are the different neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is probably the most common in the body. Acetylcholine can be both excitatory and inhibitory, depending on where it's at. We also have different names for the receptors. So acetylcholine has two types of receptors, nictitinic and muscarinic. Those are the types of receptors. Norepinephrine, you can see here, is only excitatory. And we tend to use these letters, alpha and beta. You can have alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, that kind of thing. Dopamine is both excitatory and inhibitory. And there's a lot of different types of receptors as well. We usually just give those numbers, D1, D2, D3. I think there's up to D36 now. But this is really important when we start talking about drugs that help reduce symptoms of schizophrenia, for example. Antipsychotics affect these receptors differently. Glutamate is only excitatory. And its receptors are NMDA and AMPA. And we will get into those with great depth when we talk about the hippocampus and learning, NMDA and AMPA.
serotonin, also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine, can be both excitatory and inhibitory. And we can see we call these 5-HT1, um, sometimes there's 5-HTA1. GABA is only inhibitory, slows the brain down, slows the neuron firing down. And finally, the opioids. These are our own endogenous painkillers, our own endogenous opioids. Um, you know, some uh, drugs like Oxycontin and morphines, they mimic these drugs, and we give them these kinds of letters. And we're going to talk a lot about some drugs, drugs that, that are both um, given um, by a prescription or taken recreationally. And these drugs, a lot of them affect the synapse, affect what's happening at the synapse. Okay, So everything from uh, cocaine, uh, methamphetamine, um, certain types of poisons like, uh, like, spider, like black widow spider venom, um, but also drugs that are given um, to like people who have ADHD, like Ritalin. These are all affecting the synapse activity. Uh, antipsychotics, antidepressants, an um, anxiolytics, all these types of drugs af are affecting the synapse. By the way, an anxiolytic is something that reduces anxiety. Now these drugs can have one of two effects on how well that neurotransmitter is doing, how well it's doing its job. Its job is to go to the postsynaptic cell and do something. Well, an antagonist is a drug that keeps that neurotransmitter from doing its job. It might break that neurotransmitter apart. It might keep that neurotransmitter from getting into a vesicle. It might block a neurotransmitter receptor, goes over to the receptor and acts as a, as a block. These are all things that reduces the neurotransmitter's action. It doesn't mean it's a good thing or a bad thing. It just means it inhibits that neurotransmitter from fulfilling its job of going to the postsynaptic cell and doing whatever it's going to do. An agonist, on the other hand, helps in some way, helps that neurotransmitter. Maybe it's a precursor to that neurotransmitter and it makes more of it. Um, maybe it mimics that neurotransmitter and goes over to the postsynaptic cell and fits in like a key to a lock on a receptor and, and mimics that neurotransmitter. Maybe it stops reuptake so that neurotransmitter can't be sucked back in and so that neurotransmitter is spending more time in the synapse, increasing the probability that it'll get to another receptor. An antagonist stops a neurotransmitter or hinders a neurotransmitter from doing its job, whatever that job is, and an agonist helps it. Okay, So that should give you a basic idea on how a, a neuron sends a signal to another neuron, how, neuron, how neurotransmitters are involved, how sodium, potassium, and calcium are involved. And I hope that was clear.